I'm Julius Kissinger. I live out in the country. I love it. And I am 19 years old. I was adopted when I was around six, six months old. So I was a baby. Um, and uh, my biological family had given me up um, just because they couldn't, you know, provide the care for me that they wanted to. They want me to be in a better family. And so I was adopted by another family, which is the home that I was originally um, in. And um, I was with them for 10 years, and we all lived in one, one home. Um, this was in Springfield, Ohio at the time. So um, it was all six of us, and uh, things kind of went crazy. And then I was removed from that home, and um, I was then placed, like I said, into the system for a while, and uh, me and uh, five of my other brothers and sisters, and um, I was adopted a second time by the Kissingers. And uh, the rest of my siblings, uh, the youngest, Vivian, she was adopted, um, but the rest have not been adopted. So it was really hard on us when we had to kind of split up and go into different foster homes because we were so used to being together. And, you know, we stay connected on Facebook and texting. And, you know, with technology today, it's just so easy to just be able to stay um you know, connected um, around the holidays and, you know, any special occasions. We try to get together and kind of have like that reunion just to kind of catch up. I ended up in the system, I think it's been maybe five or six years ago, you know, in foster homes and everything. I was scared. I was very scared, to be honest. Um, and I was scared because of my age. The older I got, you know, the rumor, rumor had it, you know, that, you know, as, as the older you get, the less likely, likely that you are to be able to be adopted by a family. And so um, I was scared and I was afraid that I wouldn't have a family. My sister and my brother, they didn't have the patience. I'm afraid that they didn't as far as, uh, you know, being adopted by a family or transitioning out of um, the system and aging out. The problem was is that they had so much of these feelings built up in them, the anger uh, towards the original family and the and issues that they had had. And um, in order to move on, at least for me, I had to forgive. And um, I felt like they didn't really, they took all that baggage and stuff and they brought it with them. And now it's put them in this position where they're struggling. I had to, to tell myself I'm not going to be that kid who gets addicted to something or who ends up in trouble doing something because my past was, you know, not a good situation for me. And um, like I said, you just kind of have to take the best of what you got and just make the best of it. And that's all you can really do. I was kind of like school hopping for a little bit there, just kind of going back and forth because I was in different foster homes and everything. And that was kind of a... Uh, I was, that was not easy for me. I just thought, hey, I'm gonna be a foster kid until I'm 18 and then, you know, I don't know where to go from that point. I'm on my own, um, but I was wrong. Everything just kind of started falling together and, um, you know, a lot of people say that, you know, you, you don't, like, you kind of have like a picture of how you, you kind of want things to happen, but it never goes the way you think it's gonna happen. And that's what it's just been for me. Like, it never went the way I thought it, it was going to, you know, go. And I'm happy for that because now, you know, I'm, I'm a Kissinger and I have a lot of brothers and sisters and, and a lot of people who love me. And, you know, I, it's just it's just been awesome. So as far as, um, what, you know, being adopted or, you know, um, being placed into a home or, or whatever, it was over, overwhelming. And um, there's kind of a... I don't want to say it was like a weird feeling, but it was just like, it was definitely an adjustment for me. And for a little bit, I was kind of bashful, kind of shy, um, didn't really reach out to a whole lot of kids or anything. But um, as soon as I got more comfortable with myself and with the, the Kissinger family and everything, everything just started to kind of fall into place and things started to happen. And I made a, a ton of friends and, um, you know, I, I'm still in contact uh, with some of my friends who I graduated graduated with last year. A lot of people came to the adoption, um, like the finalization, we were in court and everything. And um, like I had some like old teachers that have come, um, some really uh, dear friends that um, I've known for a long time came and uh, just a lot of people were just there to support, support me. And like, 
it was just it was overwhelming but like a good overwhelming feeling and to be surrounded by like all the people who love and care about you was just like the greatest feeling in the whole world and uh, that day was a really special day for me so honestly what i looked forward to the most was writing my name as julius kissinger i had started doing that before like we had even thought about you know um, me becoming a Kissinger and being adopted by the Kissinger family because I already felt part of the family. I mean, they treated me like I was, you know, their son as a, as a foster kid and um, it was just, you know, I felt like I was already, you know, a Kissinger. I think my biggest fear as far as like um, some of the worries and things that I felt during that time was if I got adopted, would I stay in this family because then the first family didn't work out and so that was my biggest fear was am I going to trust another family to to be able to take care of me you know I'm putting my heart out there now don't don't stomp all over it and that's kind of how I was kind of feeling at, at that time and um, I think most kids who are you know in foster care and who are going through um, some of the same some of the same things that I've gone through um, trust is kind of a really big thing like some kids put up that wall and they it's because you know they're, they're trying to protect themselves and that's kind of their way of saying that you know back off you know i'm putting my guard up i got my armor on and i had that on for a while um with friends and and um family and such and if you keep that guard up you can't you can't let go and be vulnerable um and um me letting my guard down through experience i learned um, when or when not to have that guard up, I guess, and um, how to deal with certain people or relationships. I think that for kids who refuse to let that guard down, it just kind of, uh, in a way, I feel like they don't see it, but it kind of tears them apart because you kind of lose everything with that guard up. And I had to learn to trust again and that was really hard and um, you know I'm still learning I'm still you know learning um, how to how to trust and it takes a lot at least for me for how I felt then and where I am today to start feeling again. I didn't know what love really felt like. Um, that was really hard for me and um, I think that was one of the things that I really yearned for was to be loved by a mom and a dad. Um, I think that is hard for a lot of kids. Uh, my sister, uh, she struggles with that today and um, it's sad, but if you, if you talk it out with um, people that you can trust, that you know well, you can work through those problems and um, you know, almost in a way drop that guard that you have but my problem was is that I had the guard up and I blocked everyone out. And um, you can't enjoy life that way. That, that's what I found out is that, you know, you can't, you can't really um, lean on someone, I guess. Um, and then once you unlock all those feelings again, like, you know, the, what it feels to be loved and what it feels to be really cared for by the people who love you, it's like the best thing in the whole entire world. And so, like, it was just, like, awesome for me, like, fireworks going off and people happy and you know it was just it was just I don't know, this is awesome yeah uh, I live in Ridgewood and in a small you know farmhouse before I was like oh my gosh I'm moving out to the country and it's gonna be so boring and and um, it, it hasn't turned out to be that way at all you know I was out last night looking at the stars and I was walking the dog and um, I was just like this is awesome but um, I love my room and uh, in the family room which is my favorite place here on this couch I like to play on my PlayStation, so that's kind of my thing. I don't play on it very often. I used to play on it more. My dad could tell you that. But my dad's doing to play on the PlayStation now, so sometimes he's on it more than I am. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, yeah, I like to play on the PlayStation and uh, watch Duck Dynasty on Wednesday nights with Dad. It's fun. Good stuff. My mom and my dad. Um, they've really been a big, like, influence in my life, like, current, like, what's going on today. And, um, they've really just advocated for me, you know, in my schoolwork, and, um, they were there at my sporting events, and 
when I was in band and everything, I mean, like, they're just, they're just awesome people. And, um, you know, right now I'm at the, I'm at this age or stage where I'm, like, in between, like, growing up from a little boy to a man. And let me tell you, it is not easy. <laughs> and, I, and the adult life is kind of, I will say, kind of boring. But um, I've, I've kind of, I've kind of um, been able to kind of find some happy areas in the adult in the adult world but it's an adjustment for me for sure so um my mom and dad are they're definitely like teaching me how to you know manage a bank account and do all those fun things that kids don't like to do so family that i, I have now today uh the kissinger family um is perfect um for a while, I was looking for the perfect family, and there's no such thing as a perfect family. I will tell you that because it, it you know, every family has its, you know, issues and everything. But um, for me, it felt perfect um, because I have a mom and a dad, and that's what, you know, I had always dreamed of having was just a mom and a dad who who would be able to love me. My name is Amanda Gilbert and I'm 18. I never heard about aging out until I had a friend that was like 18 and he's like, okay, I'm about to, you know, go to this uh, apartment, they're going to help me and that was the first time I had heard about it. Aging out, I know some kids want to do that, they think it's the better way to go. Pretty much you're just being thrown out with nothing and so I think that, you know, everybody should just hold in and just wait, you know, just go talk to their caseworker and say, hey, you know, I don't really want to do this. I don't want to be aged out. You know, could you try to find me a family or something? At first, I was scared of being adopted. I just, I didn't think it would work out. There's been times that I didn't want to be adopted, but, you know, I always thought, you know, if I stay here, it, I'm just going to be here and I'm going to be by myself. I do have my friends, but I wanted a family. And until I got Miss Pam, I didn't have one. And she found me one. Trusting people, it is hard. And I know how hard it can be. I've let my trust sometimes go a little bit too far with somebody that I don't even know. Um, but now I've gotten, I've been able to know like who I can trust and who I can't. There are people that you can trust out there. It might not seem like there are, and like you can't trust anybody. I've had that point before, and there are, are people out there. I didn't think that I would have a family. Uh, my caseworker hadn't said anything else before. None of my other caseworkers have. So I just, I didn't think I would be adopted. My caseworker came to me on one of her visits, and she said that there was a family she wanted me to meet and that they were really nice. I was nervous when we were coming down here because it, you know, it's kind of a far ride, new people. As soon as I got here, they were both talking to me like I've, I've been here, like they knew me. So I really liked them and it took like a week and I was here. It just ever since then, I've been happier. Every day I can just come home and I can talk to them. I've had really, really bad days and like, I've had them before at the placements. I could talk to them a little bit, but it's not like being here. It's not like having a family. When I have a really, really bad day at school, there was one time I'd, I called my dad in the middle of class. I was upset. And so I just talked to him, and he's like, everything will be okay. Just, you know, be yourself. You know, you don't need to be upset. And so every day I can just come home, and I can talk to them if I've had a bad day. And they always cheer me up and I do the same for them. We're all really close. Um, we can all talk about whatever we need to and our issues and everything and we all get along. And we try, I mean, we do all have crazy work schedules and everything, but when we're all home together we try to hang out together and plan stuff. They're really nice and they take care of me. I know some of the decisions that they make I don't agree with or it makes me angry, but Sooner or later, I finally figure out that it was because they care about me and they didn't want me to get hurt because always in the decisions when they say no, I always found out something that went wrong that 
you know, I could have been in that situation and they stopped it from happening, so I was safe. I changed my last name and um, I kept my first name that I wanted. I didn't think that everything would be like good. I didn't think I could actually have a good family like I did before and I was wrong. I'm in school for uh, early childhood education. I get to work with preschoolers at the Career Center. So I'm happy with that. I love little kids. And then once I get into college next year, I'll be going for social work. I, I know how hard it is. I've tried helping people when I was in the placements, when they were feeling down, people would come to me. I've had my counselors tell me I would probably make a good counselor. And just every other thing, my, da my dad said I could be a doctor. I, that's not what I want to do. I want to help kids that have been in the situation I have been in. And I know a little bit, I know everybody's story is different, but I think that I could help people and I really want to. So I want to go to school no matter what it takes and make sure that I become a social worker. The reason why I want to do that is because of my caseworker. I, I lost hope, like I said before. And when I found her, she gave me hope, lots and lots of hope. My advice, which you know, took me a while because I was at that breaking point where I thought, you know, I was never going to get adopted and everything. Just to hang in, uh, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel is what one of my friend's dads told me when I was at the lowest point I could be. And that really helped me. So every time that I'm upset, I always think about that and it's true. There is bad things that happen, but that just means that there's good coming. I'm Adrian McLemore, 27 years old, and I live in Dayton, Ohio. My parents got divorced very early when I was about uh, six years old. Uh, my dad uh, uh, was an abuser, my mom was an alcoholic, and they kind of mixed those two and had three kids. And so when they got divorced, my mom took us to move to Georgia where our grandma stayed, and my dad went off to uh, serve his career in the military. She would have a lot of bad evenings, uh, mix that with my bad behavior because I was a pretty uh, troublesome kid. And so eventually she got tired of taking care of me and dealing with my behavior problems and she uh, put me in foster care, um, kept my two sisters. Uh, and then um, uh, eventually she caught a uh, DUI and had to do some time in jail. And so uh, that put my two sisters in foster care. So all three of us in foster care. Uh, and so we stayed there for a while. Uh, and then a couple years after that, uh, it was up for case review. I was supposed to be up for adoption with the current family I was with uh, down in Georgia. And then um, my grandmother from my dad's side stepped in and said that, you know, she'd be willing to take me. Uh, unfortunately, uh, she never made it. She passed away in a car accident. And so uh, uh, my dad flew in for the funeral, found out what was going on with his kids being in foster care and the, the lifestyle that we were under. And so he took us to uh, move to Vegas. We moved to Vegas for a couple years. Great childhood there. And then he got orders to go overseas. I'll never forget the conversation we had. Uh, he sat us down in the living room in, in uh, November of 1997. He said, uh, you got two options. You can stay here with the babysitter, Mr. Green, till I get back, or you can move to Ohio because that's where your mom is, lives now, uh, and then I'll get you when I get back. Uh, and so we chose to be with mom. We haven't seen her in a couple years. We thought she'd maybe change. She's in a new spot now. She lived with our, our grandpa, so we thought things were a little bit better. Turned out to be a bad decision. Ended up with the same nonsense as before, you know, no lights, no food, mom's doing her own thing, out drinking and partying and doing stuff like that, and so we end up back in the system. It's just a haunting memory that me and my sisters have from, from that conversation of whether we should have stayed till he got back or, you know, waited, but either way, he ended up passing away, so I don't know. Well, when I went to foster care, you know, they divert funds from child support to your foster parents, and so what would happen is my mom would get me out of foster care to start receiving the checks back and then when she started receiving the checks back she'd throw me back into foster care so I bounced from foster care between foster care and my mom back and forth like I was some type of throwaway item uh, and that's something that I can't relate to this year and that's very tough to deal with um, even at this age yeah my mom calls me sometimes but it's usually in a drunken state and it's on a voicemail about how much she hates me how she wish she had an abortion so on and so forth the last time I saw her um, I was on my way home uh, from work she had pulled up next to me and she rolled down a window and said hi and I said hey mom and then the light turned green thank God because I couldn't deal with it and I just drove off.
When I came back into foster care, I was uh, 15 years old, and that's a prime age where it's very tough to adopt a 15-year-old African-American kid in the foster care system. That's just, the odds were stacked against me. My first foster home was great, uh, and the reason why it was so great was that the foster dad reminded me so much of my real dad. He was, a, he was in the military, in the Air Force, just like my dad, very strict. My foster mom, his wife, though, um, was a bit more mean, and she also uh, practiced a different religion than I had grew up in, and so what... A lot of our problems came from she wanted me to attend uh, the church services that she wanted to, and I didn't like that. Uh, and so there was a rule that if I wasn't in the house um, by the time they got back from their particular service, then I'd be locked out. And so there was a couple nights uh, where I ended up uh, sleeping in the park uh, over in Five Oaks in Dayton, Ohio. One day we got into an argument in the basement, um, and she called my caseworker, moved me to my next foster home uh, that following day. I've moved between foster home and biological parents my entire life. I think I did the average I, uh, from a couple years ago. If you look at the average of times I've been on houses I've been with between parents and foster care, I've moved almost every six months. And I just literally get tired of moving. And so I just stuck it out uh, and did what I could to survive until it, it got time to go to college and I could move on campus. On the one hand, I was excited that I was going to be aging out, but on the, on the other hand, I was terrified because I had absolutely no idea how it was going to be for me to go to college. Uh, I got to campus in the fall, uh, and it was like being in foster care all over again, um, seeing normal kids, so to speak, move in with their parents, uh, and it's just me moving in with caseworkers in a county van, um, realizing that my roommate could go home on the weekends, and his mom called and checked on him, and... Um, asked how his classes were going and things of that nature and then everything I owned was inside my dorm room and it was so it was just it was very depressing my first year of, of college uh, to be quite honest extremely depressing yeah I'd worked a lot to try to pay for school and in working 40 50 hours a week at a restaurant grades slipped and so eventually I was kicked out of college um, and they told me I had to sit out for an entire year uh, and so I took the dismissal letter and I framed it and determined that I would get back in school and once I got back in school the that I wouldn't mess up that opportunity again what I found myself doing is making myself so busy that I didn't have time to think about, you know, my life that was going on. And so that's what caused a lot, a lot of my uh, early life mistakes is trying to consume myself with so much so that you really don't process what's really going on. It was difficult for me to get through these 10 years, and I'm a pretty strong kid. Just imagine the kid that gets there and gets this first run in with the bad grade or its first run in with depression or its first run in with not seeking out help. They're they're out on the streets and they're pretty much they give up on college they start going to work or they start hustling and end up in jail end up doing whatever end up having kids it doesn't matter you know that first sign of trouble they were like I'm not going through this again I'll just cut my ties and just make it on my own one percent of youth will foster youth will ever graduate with a college degree no one talks to you about the pressures of college how it's going to be what happens when you're having one of those bad days and you feel depressed who do you talk to things of that nature. Um, bills, surviving out here on the own, paying rent, uh, paying for car, no car insurance, finding a job, all those things, and balancing a social life. Foster care makes you so dependent on caseworkers and staff and teach you things, and then when you get out on your own, they require that you do it yourself, and you really don't know how to because you've always had it done. I've never been alone in life, but I've always felt isolated. It's, it appeared to me like every time I got close to an individual, especially a parental figure, they were taken away. Whether it was the great foster home, my very first foster home with the Lukes, whether it was my grandma, whether it was my dad, whether it was my biological mom to her diseases, whether it's to my, my last foster home to, to just being a mean person. Um, and you always you start to look internally, well, what is it about me that makes me unadoptable? The greatest compliment that I'm always given is, uh, your parents must be so proud. But that's also the most heartbreaking because I don't have parents. And so the way I've carried myself and the way that I try to live and act now is based solely off what I see from regular families, of what I would like to see happen. The way I treat my niece and nephew is the way I would have liked to have been treated by a mom and a dad. There's always been a void missing where you wanted a mom and dad to come home to. And little events that make that remind you that you don't have parents. Like important social issues that you want to talk about when you search your phone and there's no one to talk to because no one understands your personality. Or, you know, a simple conversation about women or a conversation about how to raise kids or struggling through college. I mean, there's not really a big Rolodex for me to go through to talk to someone about what's going on. There's nothing like having someone to call at the end of the day. And when I say call, I mean call and visit, live, spend a night, meal, email, help you when you're down, that type of call.
But I would encourage you to find your permanent family or to have a permanent connection with someone, mentor, foster family, if you had a good foster family, uh, or even consider adoption because there's nothing like having someone to call at the end of the day. It is very difficult to try to go through this world alone. And so many of us think that we are equipped to do that, but it's just not the case. My name's Nancy Sue Williams. I'm 19 years old and I live in New Albany, Ohio. I was in foster care all my life and I was almost gonna turn 18. I, I really wanted to get adopted because I didn't wanna be on the streets because I would have nowhere to go. And my foster mom, <clears throat> um, they, their plan was I could stay till I was 21, but then they were gonna put me in like a group home and I didn't want that. Um, right, right when they showed me the video, I said, Yes, let's go. Let me move in this week. And they said, don't you want to meet him first? So I met him and I stayed over the night here and then went back to my um, foster home. I said, oh, I got to move in this week and got, all, um, got adopted October 4th. When I moved here, I was very testy because I had moved from like seven or eight different foster homes before because I would get upset and then they said, and then they would just move me because they couldn't handle my tantrums. Um, I feel that it might not work out, even though I can't help it and it's my disability, I can't help throwing fits, so are they still going to keep me? And so, I came here, I started out good, but then I started my tantrums again trying to test mom and dad, um, like, um, to see if they, it was really going to be official, I was really, really going to get adopted. But then, I realized that, hey, I throw these fits and these people don't move me like everybody else, so... So I think I'm good. I need to stop throwing fits now because I know I'm not going to move anywhere if they haven't moved me by now. So, And the day before I got adopted, I started calming down. And then when I got adopted, I still feel did change them a little bit, but I haven't done one in a year or so. It was a really excited feeling. A bunch of people came to my adoption. And when I got adopted, I got all these other gifts, but I didn't care about the gifts. I just cared that I'm here with my sister, Sarah. Dad has... Dad has three kids and mom, my adoption mom has three kids and Sarah was hers. When I got adopted, I was mom and dad's kid. I was happy that day because I got my forever home. I don't have to go back and I get to stay with my mom, my dad, and my sister. I was a little scared, but then when I, then I finally started calming down and I wasn't scared anymore because I got a family that loves me and stuff and I'm just happy that I don't have to be out on the streets. I looked forward to having a new family, new animals, you know, and my, staying with my sister and playing a lot with her. We play dolls, we watch movies, we also listen to music, we play outside together. Um, she loves singing karaoke, so I just listen. <laughs> um, my dad was in the Marines um, and stuff like that, and he's a really good cook. I love when he cooks his hamburgers and his ribs and stuff. And my mom, I love... I love her, and if there's any problem that I have, I just go to her, and she um, loves making Barbie doll dresses for me and stuff. Well, some children in foster care are scared to be adopted because they don't know what's going to happen or what's expected of them. That don't be afraid to get adopted because if you if you get adopted, you'll have a a family to go to for Christmases and birthdays, and you'll get a forever home. And you get and you age out of the system and live on the streets, then you would have nowhere to go. Not they would have no one to care for them in their life, but if they if they do get adopted, they'll have a loving family for and a forever home forever. My mother was in not necessarily a good parent. She um, is a great friend though, not really a good parent. She uh, she was on drugs at the time and. Hearing her there, she um, she could not take care of me. Her sister has had me since I was born. We live with my aunt and her three kids, and she got laid off her work, and she couldn't afford to keep keep us anymore. She couldn't afford to take care of us, and her three children went to live with their father, and then it was me and my brother who did not know our father, so we kind of moved around with her, and end up in uh, end up being back with my mother, and her girlfriend at the time. She was abusive, so we end up through turns of events we end up both in foster care. I live with the same foster mom till I emancipated. The reason why I wasn't adopted, I was afraid, and I can say that now, because I was at the time, nothing scared me. I was a teenager, never been a really emotional person. 
because I never could be. I never, you know, I had a lot to overcome. So you don't really want to be the crybaby. Um, and I feel like there's always somebody going through something worse. So what are you crying over? Build a bridge, learn how to get over it, move forward. So at the time when they were talking to me about adoption, I was completely against it for two reasons. One reason was because my brother was in foster care as well. Um, we were in the same foster home. He's older than me. And he was like, you're not leaving me. And then um, we're doing this together. I was pretty much scared. I was scared to actually, to actually go with somebody I didn't know. I did try it for a little bit and then I backed out. And I am one of those people who would not do anything I'm not sure about. I'm very bullheaded, very strong-headed. It was too permanent for me. And because I had been in the same home for so long, it wasn't necessarily a need for stability anymore because I had that in the home I was at. Yeah. But what I didn't realize is that I would want it in the long run. I didn't have friends at all. I never had friends. Um, my brother was my friend and that was it. When I lost my family, I felt like I lost everything. It was, um, it was really hard for me to communicate with people who were not in my, who didn't, who weren't in my struggle. My weight got out of control when I went into foster care when I was in fifth grade. Um, I think I went through a state of depression. So in like every year I was gaining about 50 pounds, just about. Um, and I think that kind of made me not have friends either. Not because I was overweight, because I didn't want them, because I didn't like who I was. So I had to, of course, put a shell up so no one thought that I wasn't happy being plus. No one ever would know that. But it wasn't, it was to the point where it was uncomfortable and I was always tired and, um, Diabetes was around the corner and high blood pressure was knocking on my door and I'm 25 so something had to change. I ended up getting a gastric bypass. I have a really good health insurance now with the job I have. So with the career I'm building. So a lot of stuff I'm having to do slowly. I was just an angry teen. I was really angry. I mean, I've always had a mouth for me. I've not been a... Um, I've, I think I'm always, I've always had a good spirit, I guess, but I was angry at some point. So I just took it out on everybody for a really long time. I was a mess. My mom kind of came back in my life um, to help her a little bit, to kind of reel me back in a little bit. Cause at some point I was sneaking to see her and then my foster mom found out and she was like, look, we're not supposed to do this, but if this is going to help you not become a product of your environment and not become this like angry, evil teen, then maybe, maybe this will help because I was actually in counseling and that was one of the things I was working on. So she would sneak and let me see her. She would let her come over to the house for dinners and gatherings and Christmas and all types of stuff like that. And my mom had actually been clean at that point for years. So she would actually let her come around. Something she wasn't allowed to do, but she did for me. So I think she does kind of love me a little bit. I definitely have an uncommon story. <laughs> Cause um, my mother and my foster mother still communicate to this day. I always wonder if I'm gonna be a good mother. I don't really have a lot of good leadership to look up to. It took me years to forgive her. That was the difference between me and my brother. The reason why I didn't want to see her or I would avoid her and things like that is because I didn't forgive her for a long time. My mom never set out to hurt us. She would, I guess no mother really does. She was just an absentee parent. It's just, we're really, really good friends. Really, really good friends. And she's learned how to be okay with me having a lot of different mothers. I had nowhere else to go after foster care. So college was the only other option for me um, because there was no way that I would be able to, I'd never lived on my own before, never paid a real bill. Why would I go live in an apartment and have no idea what I'm doing? <laughs> and I didn't have necessarily the financial support to where if I couldn't pay my bill, who's gonna pay it? I didn't have a mother who could pay it. My foster mom, that was not her responsibility. And then my best friend, she's in the same situation as me. We're the same age. So I had to be a trailblazer. That's all I knew. Honestly, it was a survival tactic, not necessarily because I thought college was the best thing ever, no. 
it was survival. Even though I was necessarily, a be I had behavioral issues, I was still always a straight A student. So I knew that that's one thing I could do, was school. That was the one thing that I had to work with. So I did what I knew. I think the biggest regret of mine is like, like vice versa, I had to go get an apartment because I had nowhere to stay over breaks. Everybody else takes that as advantage of having somewhere to come home to. I didn't have that. Um, having somewhere to go wash my clothes, <laughs> that was a big issue. Um, just little stuff that you don't think means a lot actually came back to mean so much more to me once I got in college. Um, holidays, breaks, um, not knowing anybody else who went to college was a really big issue for me because when I felt my first class or got kicked out because I didn't know financial aid was based on attendance. No one told me that. So I never want, was big on going to class. I didn't ever need to. Like, why I have to go to this eight o'clock class? Dude, I could take this test and pass it with going once a week, stop the madness. So I would literally, so I would literally go on test day, get an A on the test, because I would read the book. Wasn't that I didn't read it, I just didn't feel like I had to get up at 8 o'clock in the morning for absolutely no reason. So those were some things that kind of benefited me, but nobody told me that attendance was how they based financial aid. So they would drop you from your course if you did not go. Somebody could have saved me a, a good heartache. I think that was the first time I had cried in like maybe about three, four years. I literally was on the floor, sitting in the hallway in my dorm room crying because I had got kicked out of a class my freshman year. The first time ever. I did not know, I didn't know that. I wish I had somebody who just could kind of guide it. I still feel like I don't have any guidance because I've always been a trailblazer, right? So I don't necessarily have anybody to say, this is some things you should do. This is some things you shouldn't do. Everything is trial and error for me and I hate that. Aging out the system is the dumbest thing that anybody could do because it's not set up. It's set up to take care of children, not adults. Let's just be honest. So. Aging out the system probably is better now than when I did it eight years ago, but and emancipation has definitely gotten a lot better, especially with FCCS. But when I was coming through, it was not that good. I mean, if you're talking about healthcare stopped, um, I still really need to get my teeth fixed so bad, but I don't necessarily have the financial, I don't have the financial stability to do that right now. And so those are the things. Health insurance was something that was hard. Once I aged out the system, that stuff stopped. I mean, going to the doctor, having, um, I had a scare with cervical cancer. I had all that happen to me in college. I had nobody to go to. And um, another thing was learning about birth control and that type of thing. I didn't have those problems and I wasn't that girl. You know, just things like that. You didn't necessarily, didn't, you didn't have health insurance. Even just to regulate some things or just as a woman, you didn't have that type of insurance to get pap smears and, that type of stuff. I didn't know anything about that th that stuff. And so once I aged out the system and I was away in Kentucky, was a completely different ball game. I think if I had parents <laughs> that would actually belong to me or I belong to them, would have, would have definitely guided me. And then they will only help you so far to where you have to help yourself. And if you really have never helped yourself before, you're really in a bad situation once that six months of, of help stops, you know, or I definitely don't know exactly how it all works now, but when I aged out, it was six months, and then it was like, good luck, see ya. I um, did a little research online and figured and learned that if you're an orphan of the court, that you can apply for in uh, temporary residency. So I applied for temporary residency in, residency in Kentucky, and I was granted that, so it gave me in-state tuition which gave me more than enough money to go to school for four years. And so on top of that, I asked Deanna, I need my orphan of the court letter. And so I took that when I was in 2007, I took that and um, I went and got me an apartment income base. If you're, you can get an income based apartment if you were an orphan of the court before you were, I mean, as of 18, if you're a med state from the system. So I still have that apartment. I didn't necessarily couldn't stay with my biological mom. She was still going through her transition. My foster mother had children in her house, but she couldn't let me stay there either. So that's why I ended up getting an apartment. In the city I live in, all my friends have graduated and went back home to live with their families or went back home, period. 
And I didn't have anywhere to come back home to, so that's why I stayed in Kentucky. That's why I still live in Frankfurt now. I refused to move out because I am attached. It was the first place my own. It was the first place to call home. The biggest thing for me was the emotional support. I mean, there was many times where I just wanted somebody to call and I didn't have that support. Or somebody to come see me or when you get homesick, I got homesick, but I had nowhere to go home to, to to cure the sickness, if you know what I mean. So I think I think we kids get so afraid of being absent from their biological families or not knowing what's next that they shoot themselves in the foot. And I shot myself in the foot so many times. Oh my God. If I could have if I could literally go back ten years from now, ten years ago, and go back and just really do something different, I would. I would have took advantage of every opportunity that was given to me. I would have, I would have understood more what a family was then because I, I still don't understand what a family is now. I never necessarily had that, but I wish I would have taken advantage of some of that stuff, man. I really, really, really wish I would have took advantage, especially of being adopted, because I think that was the one thing that I did not do that could have helped me so much. I mean, graduation from college was probably the most saddest um, hard day in the world. My um, adoption worker could not make it, um, but my tap, my tap people, Miss Regina and uh, Miss Cherie, came. Um, my biological family, what a headache, what a headache. Um, they all came to stay in my apartment, but I had to pay for them to come. I did not have the financial stability to be able to do that. Um, all the kids and all the drama and paying for myself a graduation party. Me and uh, four of my other girlfriends, we all graduated together. Um, our, we had a graduation party together, which we all split equally five ways their families came by truckloads okay I had about five people at the max and um, I am from a huge family huge um, all the people that I expected to come did not come it was really hard for me to walk across that stage without without a lot of people there for me but I realized I've been doing it on my own for a long time so I wasn't necessarily surprised I was just sad by it it was really, really hard for me that day. That day was really hard. If you find somebody to love you or give you what your family couldn't, why not take advantage of that opportunity? Find a way to be normal. You know what I mean? Because that will be the one thing that will give you, you're never going to be like everybody else. That's not really what you want. But you want to at least have a fighting chance, if that makes sense. Because I'm an exception to the rule. I don't believe that my story is, everybody's not going to have my story. There is a few people who are going to make it out, but most of us, all the people who left TAP and who aged out the system and went off to college that I know, 80% of them didn't graduate. It's a definitely a better success right now, I think, but my time, there was not. So if you had that opportunity to have somebody to hug you, to give you love, to give you financial support, to give you emotional stability, to just be there for you when you need somebody to be there for you or you have nobody to be, or or just to have somebody to call home to. Why not give yourself that chance? If it does not work, you try. What's the big deal? So, things don't work all the time. Stuff happens, life, it's called life. But to actually give yourself a fighting chance would just be all I would ask of somebody because I didn't give myself that. And I had to work 20 times harder than everybody else to get to the same place as everybody else. Just make it easier on yourself. You already had a hard life. You just gonna make it harder? <laughs> like That's really what, that's what I would say to somebody. If I could go back and talk to Renee, you know, when she was 12 or 13, to say, girl, wake up, give yourself a chance. Give yourself the stability that you never had. Just because you're in the same place for a long time does not mean that stability. That just means that you're in the same place. Location is not stability.